Hey everyone. We're glad to have you join us today as we talk about transforming identity. So this is a webinar that we'll be sharing. This is a partnership between CyberArk and Strata. And really what we're gonna be digging into is a no-code approach for ditching legacy IM and embracing a modern identity system. And we're gonna take a little bit of a different path today that I think you're gonna enjoy. So I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Mark Callahan. I'm on the product marketing team here at Strata Identity. And I'm joined by Brandon McCaffrey, a strategy architect over at Cyber. Hey, Brandon, thanks for joining me. Mark, so excited to be here. Love this. Awesome. Well, today I promise we're gonna we're gonna take our audience down a little bit different path. And they're probably wondering about where does like legacy identity come into play and how do we make that exciting and interesting? And Brandon, you and I did this session earlier this summer at Identiverse. And at Identiverse, the, the storyline and the theme that everyone was following was this idea of the digital identity engine. And you and I, both liking cars a bit, decided to take this down a path of how do we tie this into cars? And so we're actually going to connect cars and identity. And you, our audience, are probably going, all right, where is this headed? Bear with us. So in terms of what we're going to cover today, we're going to cover three things. So we're going to talk about the challenges of those so-called vintage IAM systems, whether that's your infrastructure or your applications. We're going to look at electrifying your legacy apps and infrastructure. Probably still wondering what that is. Stay tuned. And then we're also going to go into a demo. So without further ado, Brandon, you ready to jump into this? I am so excited. And Mark, you know, you really are the car guy, but I, I will try my best to keep up with your car. <laughs> Let, let's dig in. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. All right. So, Brandon, you know, we, we talked with the uh, audience prior about this, you know, wondering what do these two cars have in common with your identity infrastructure? And so as as people are looking at the, the images on the screen here on the top, you've got this gorgeous classic. It's a 1971 Chevelle 454 SS. This thing moved. And on the bottom there, you've got a new Tesla Model S Plaid. Now, just out of curiosity, Brandon, which would you rather have in your garage? That's a that's a toughie, but probably the Chevelle. So it's a thing of beauty. It's just absolutely a thing of beauty. And the thing of beauty here is that in 1971, zero to 60 in 6.1 seconds was considered pretty darn fast. I mean, like really fast. Like this was top of the line at the time. This is the best performance we were seeing in, in production automobiles. And I hate to say it, but my my Ford truck can actually do that now even better. And so it's like times have changed. And so as you're looking at this, what's happened? You know, you see that like the Model S. All of a sudden, we're talking about sub two second times in zero to sixty. And once again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that Chevelle. It just that was the best available at the time. And now we've got these cars like the, the Model S that are doing it in less than two seconds. I mean, chiropractors are thrilled, I'm sure. But nevertheless, we're not going to throw away the Chevelle. We want both of these. But how do we get that middle ground between them? And so this takes us into that idea of where those challenges arise from vintage IAM infrastructure. So, Brandon, as we dig into this, I took some pictures more of that, that Chevelle, and I'm going to dig in here. So, you know, as, as we look at this, you know, the first challenge of vintage IAM infrastructure that we talk about is that, that lack of security. And so hopefully you, my audience, you know, as you're looking at this, you're going, what's missing from this picture? And one of the first things you might notice is there's no seatbelts. They actually are there. There's some lap belts that are hidden. They're actually a uh, an option at the time. There's definitely no airbag. And there's probably just other things that are missing from this. But you know what? At the time, this made sense. And so a lot of the problems that we run into, you know, Brandon, you and I were talking about client problems, is that they're using infrastructure that was built for problems of the time, not problems of today. And so what we're looking at is they they, they predate today's identity related threats. You know, is, are there examples that you had in mind where it just that happens? Yeah, 100 percent. You know, I and this hits home because I've been in some airbag optional or uh, not <laughs> not included kind of cars. Right. Um, in my time. And uh, and definitely, as we've seen um like legacy IDPs, when we go into environments of customers that, that have these, um, some of them didn't even come with the concept of like multi-factor authentication built in, right? Uh, and, and as security practitioners, that's probably the number one control many of us uh, enforce on our users, right? Just like seat belts and airbags in your car. So I, I love the metaphor, um, but it's it's very true now, especially when you think of like all the next generation attacks that are out there. I mean, you have people yes. using chat GPT, for attacks on infrastructure that was built in the 90s that had zero concept of these kind of uh, new age uh, attack vectors. So 100%, like a lot of the 
the legacy ways of doing things. They didn't really, of course, naturally have accounting for for some of these new threats that we're seeing. That's it. That's it. You know, and as we look at this, we're not going to stop driving the Chevelle. <laughs> we're going to take this out every weekend. This is our our Sunday driver, right? But you may think twice about bringing the kids to school in it as a daily driver because it's just it's lacking some of that security infrastructure. So we we got to think about what we could do to update it. So. Speaking about updating things, this next picture is kind of fun because it's actually in the engine, you know, pop the hood of the, the Chevelle and this thing's gorgeous. I mean, we've got chrome everywhere. I can't tell you how long it probably took to detail this to get to that level of cleanliness that we see here. But what you don't see, especially in vintage automobiles, is how much duct tape and bailing wire is underneath this holding everything together. If you slid on a dolly on your back and a creeper and you were underneath this looking up above, you're going to find a lot of things that don't show from the top because that's what it takes to keep the whole thing together, to keep this running. And, and I think the analogy here is there's a lot of custom code and, and things that are just stuck together and, and don't touch it because it works it's scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. There's, um, I I've worked with uh, many customers that they've had an architect that built all of this amazing uh, identity architecture, right? Sometimes open source, uh, sometimes with with a vendor, but they've extended it to uh, through all the way throughout their environment, like they were supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. But then that person leaves, and all of a sudden, it's like, what? Well, Joe's not here. We don't know how in the world he was keeping this all together, right? So that's that's one of those uh, other issues with kind of the legacy IM and uh, our architecture is that, hey, it's great while well, you have this specialty, but once the specialty leaves, it can be really, really expensive outside of the servers and the environments that are a cost uh, factor. The the maintenance on that is a huge challenge for it, it, huge it big organizations. Right. The, the servers, like FTEs, just to keep the servers running. You know, there's there's not necessarily a Chilton's shop guide for how things were built. Documentation's probably lacking. And again, you get a lot of this sort of like hands off, don't touch. We're afraid it works, so don't don't breathe on it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, a very common challenge that we see. You know, and and so now we're looking, you know, at the steering wheel. And hopefully, you know, our audience, you know, as you're looking at this, there's one of two reactions you're having. There's either some things that are completely missing or, oh my gosh, that's very simple and I get it. But what's different between the Chevelle that we're looking at here in this picture and when you go into a Tesla Model S or any Tesla for that example, is you've got a steering wheel and an LCD screen. And that that's all there is in, in, in the, the Tesla. And so when you have customers who are expecting one experience and then they get in here and there's analog gauges and there's things you have to touch and slide and adjust, like this feels weird, right? Because a lot of times with legacy infrastructure, you also have legacy authentication methods that you might be bringing over usernames and passwords. I, I don't have a post-it note handy, but you know, the, the dreaded post-it note scenario, right? Yeah, it's like the, like you said, with the uh, Tesla, you basically have like an iPad in front of you, right? You can play video games now on, on your car. Uh, so the, the future is exciting. And the, the same with legacy IAM. Uh, I, I worked with a couple customers, but one that I thought was really interesting was working with uh, a, a defense uh, company that their legacy IAM architecture, like their IT team actually saw that as holding back the user experience. And they wanted to be able for mover joiners levers to actually give them a super modern UI, a kind of UI of the future of work, workers accessing what they need to at mm -hmm. work or secure, uh, just so they can compete with some of the new entrants, the new startups in the, the defense and space industry. Uh, so I thought that was a, a really great, like forward thinking IT team of like, no, we want to be on the leading edge. Uh, with the experience we offer users. That's, I mean, that's like an HR angle here. You don't want to like have somebody, yeah. you know, right. You're like, what would be your thoughts if you called an Uber and this is, this is what you saw up front you know, around the side, you'd be a little nervous. Right. But you know, and, and that's something we see a lot at, at Strata as well is that like 20% of the apps take 120% of the time because it's a completely different experience, you know? And, and so it's this idea of like so smooth and streamlined and self-driving on this one side for the majority of that experience. But then there's that little edge of things that you're just like, whoa, this is weird. How do I do this? And yes, post-it notes, all sorts of security laps, things that happen. And even as you just said, like this HR story, who wants to work at the place where you don't have the LCD screen and it's just like the, the, the UI of the future. So, well, yes, absolutely. So this broken and disjointed UX. This picture I love. 
because I talked about those seat belts being an optional item in the, uh, the earlier photo. So as you think about the inability to maintain compliance and visibility of legacy uh, infrastructure, this rear view mirror actually is a perfect analogy for that because that little two inch by three inch piece of chrome is on the passenger side. So first of all, once again, this was an option. The driver's side rear view was actually there. Side mirror was actually there. You had to pay extra and actually option this from the factory to have the one on the right. But then again, two inches by three inches, how much can you actually see out of that versus the rear view cameras and the surround cameras that you get out of the, the Tesla or a modern vehicle today? You just don't have the visibility you once did, but this was amazing and cutting edge for the time. This was pretty awesome. You know, we just, those changing landscape, you know, regulations and stuff. You, you mentioned that at the beginning. You know, any stories here? Oh, yeah. Uh, the the legacy IM players, like one of the biggest challenges and actually one of the biggest like movers for a lot of organizations is the upcoming uh, regulations that they need to abide by, whether that's SOX, whether that's GDPR, um, uh, some of the regulation coming out of APAC right now. It's it's very similar to in the auto industry one when, when seatbelts started to be a requirement as a law. All of a sudden, you can't be a manufacturer that is not using seatbelts. Right. Some of these legacy IM systems, the open source or whatnot, they're not really in a position to help customers keep up to date with the current regulations or the future regulations that we see on the horizon. So that's of course a huge, huge reason for folks to reconsider the IM. Uh, infrastructure that they've had is to make sure they're on the forefront with abiding by those regulations. And so in that scenario, the onus is actually on the customer themselves to abide by the regulations and and try to patch and retrofit what they have to make exactly. sure they're current and don't get in trouble. And and it's it's not just like, oh, do you have a team staffed in London or elsewhere? It's actually, do you do business elsewhere, right? So the, the customer landscape is introducing a whole host of new regulations too. And um, yeah, again, the car analogy just keeps carrying forward, I think, throughout here, does it not? It's too perfect. It's perfect. Well, last one, I promise our audience. Okay, so the lack of innovation. Now, as you think back to the, the Chevelle that we started the, the story with, you'll see that the, the gear shifter sits between the seats and it's this big, huge steel handle and it's actually stuck in park. And that's a great metaphor here because as you think about legacy IAM infrastructure, first of all, it's multi-generational. So, you know, our audience, IAM architects, you can relate to this, I'm sure. Most of the problems you face today are probably ones you inherited when you got hired. You started your job, you looked at the big list of a backlog and your legacy tech debt, and you're still biting that list today. And that's the problem with like these legacy things is that you're you're stuck in park. You're you're missing out on innovation and competitiveness. Thoughts there, Brandon? Yep. Lots of IT teams I'm talking to. They're they're thinking about okay, what's coming next? They have teams bringing them new applications, new use cases every day, and they want to be able to support their business to be on the forefront of innovation and that they want an easy way to do that. So a hundred percent that having the modern IAM uh, infrastructure is gets you there a lot faster and that they definitely want that. You know, they're, they're, I actually heard an analyst at a, uh, a London event mention that if you don't address your legacy tech debt, you're basically guaranteed that your IAM team, the majority of their projects will be unplanned ones. And that's, that's really it, right? I mean, when you're stuck in park, like you are with this vintage car, you're, you're not staying competitive. You're not focusing on innovation and the really hard problems. You're simply chipping away at that, that at never ending just acclimation of, uh, of, uh, tech net. And so it's like really important to, to think about this. So what do we do, Brandon? So that's the question here. So part two of this is we dig into how do we elect electrify your legacy apps and your infrastructure? So. This particular slide has four different images on it, and I've actually got four different vintage cars here that are all at least 30 years old, if not older. And the thing that you see in common across these is the fact that each of them doesn't have an internal combustion engine under the hood. They've each been retrofitted with an electric crate motor so that you keep all the goodness of everything and all the memories and the stories and the blood, sweat, tears, and gears that you've put into those 30 year old vintage infrastructures and you're able to modernize it. So you keep all the good and you actually add even better as you look at the, the modern system that, that sits on top of this. And so I think what we're suggesting today is this idea of how do you electrify your vintage architecture? So where, where would we go with this, Brandon? Yeah. So it, if you're to take this analogy, right, CyberArk really uh, is the electric engine. 
in this scenario, the, the new age modern I am uh, infrastructure. And with that, w- what we're focused on really for, for our customers is A, solving the security problem. We've seen way, way, way too many breaches. And a lot of those are actually starting uh, at the workforce. It's starting at the compromised identity of the individual user, right? So making sure that this new age uh, reimagined, uh, if you will, security for the workforce and for human identities, that security is built in with with fundamental controls. Um, Making sure it's unified, right? That you can see kind of everything that the user has access to and uh, uh, get a full 360 uh, degree of that. So you're saying more than that little two inch by three inch chrome mirror. We want this unified. We want to see everything. Exactly. Exactly. And then, of course, that the, the, the platform's covering all the identities. And actually, th- this is foundationally the CyberArk identity security platform. Right. And what, what I think is ties into a lot of the things that we've been talking about. You'll see at the middle, I'm not going to go into each one of these things, it's too, it's too long here, but you'll see right at the middle and the core of this platform is intelligence, security intelligence, so that we can understand with that unified view, every single thing the user has access to, um, what they're doing inside of those different uh, targets, ses- uh, sessions, systems, et cetera. And then we can provide intelligent privilege controls throughout all of those different sessions for the user. So it's really an end-to-end uh, modern platform built to cover every identity, both human and machine uh, identities, which are growing at a rapid rate. Uh, our, our latest numbers were like 45 to one on that, right? So making sure that every single identity that we see across the spectrum of our organization has these modern controls that help you with compliance and that they help you actually prevent those kind of attacks. So that's the engine that we're talking about. I love about. it. Right, that that's it. You know, it's, it, this is the, the analog that we are using here is the idea of a crate motor. And so for the audience, as, as I mentioned that crate motor before, if you weren't familiar with the option or the idea of that, the notion of a crate motor, that's that all the major manufacturers will actually assemble just the motor for individuals to buy off the assembly line that don't actually go into production vehicles. They're actually intended to be put into other vehicles. And so you can buy those and put it into your own vintage hot rod. You can put it into a modern car. You can do engine swaps. But the idea of that crate motor, what we've talked about here is very much that Cybark is the crate motor. But what about all that yellow wiring, right? So we, we had the yellow wiring that we saw under the hood of all of those different uh, uh, restored vehicles that I had in the, in the four by picture. And I'd like to think of uh, Strata's role in this as that that wiring, because as we look at that vintage architecture, how do you match up that crate motor with it, under the hood of the 71 Chevelle with like a legacy drivetrain and legacy steering and legacy electrical systems? How does that all wire together and match? Well, that yellow wiring is really where Strata comes in and why we've partnered together as closely as we have is the idea of uh, using orchestration as, as the tool to, to drive those changes. And you wouldn't be able to do this with these vintage apps otherwise because the vintage apps themselves are so tightly ingrained with the you know existing WAM or legacy IDP of, of, of sorts. And, and again, it's like that, don't breathe on it. It works, nobody touch it. You mentioned, Brandon, the idea that a lot of times changes in, in code was written by teams who are no longer here. They've been thrice replaced since they've been there. No documentation. So how do you match up the wiring? Well, you need a solution that does that. And that's where identity orchestration from Strata comes in because it really makes all of those different identity systems work together like CyberArk with the apps, no matter what they are, without recoding. And so if I were to look at sort of a whiteboard of how this all works together, this is sort of a subway diagram left to right here, We're actually going to talk specifically in our demo about a legacy application that's a non-standard app that was written, again, prior to modern identity protocols. Nothing wrong with that. It was written in the best possible way at the time. But how do you adjust it and modify it so it takes all the best and all the goodness that comes from uh, CyberX platform? And how do you add that to these applications without having to tear down the app and just throw it away and start from scratch? Because traditionally, you'd have to refactor it. Well, that's where this orchestrator comes into play. And the the cool thing that's happening here is that these legacy apps over on the right side of the screen are getting all the benefits and protection of CyberArk, 
but they're still getting the headers data that they're expecting. So the apps themselves are none the wiser. What we're talking about here is dropping that crate motor of CyberArk under the hood, using the wiring of orchestration from Strata to connect all the systems so that they all work seamlessly together, and the car not knowing anything's definitely changed. And, and, and that's the best part about doing all this. And so, you know, Brandon, you and I did this uh, a while back, as I mentioned at Identiverse. I'd love to switch and just show a video demo of what we did uh, at the time, just to sort of play through how this how this works. And so, obviously, you're familiar with this this login screen. And I'm going to start with all the. This is already an app that's been protected by Cyber. So this is kind of an anticlimactic uh, demo, just as the best identity demos are. It's like it worked. But <laughs> what we're doing here is obviously using CyberArk Identity to log into a protected application. Now, this protected app that you're looking at on the screen here is a legacy standard app that we use, that uh, legacy non-standard app, I should say, that is actually taking uh, the attribute data directly from CyberArk that I'm highlighting here is this is the, the first name, last name of Alan Atkins. And what it's going to do is it's actually using those attributes then to personalize the session. And it's actually creating a header that's being fed to the application. So the application doesn't think anything's changed. Again, this is the crate motor inside of a legacy app, inside of a vintage vehicle. So how do we do it? So this is our UI. And what I'm going to start with here is the first thing we do is we create an identity fabric. And we're going to add CyberArk as an integration here. We're using OIDC. And the way that we're going to do this is we're just going to copy all the information uh, that's in these fields below, just config, no code, that they would get from your environment. And, and they would put it in here. Now, next, I'm going to take the application, and this happens to be a proxy-based app, as oftentimes those applications protected by SiteMinder are. And what we're doing here is, see, this is the URL that you can uh, use that's actually for the demo app. And off to the right, I've actually got the resources. So for fine-grained authorization, different pages within the app, and, and how we want to protect those. But basically, we're modeling the app. We're getting it added. So third, we're going to create a user flow. So we're going to create something called the Canary CyberArk user flow. And what we're doing here is we're going to take the, we're going to skip the, the attribute provider is actually coming from CyberArk. But what we're going to do is we're going to create a very basic policy that just says that it requires authentication by CyberArk OIDC uh, for the user to be admitted. And in doing that, we're actually going to go down and we're assigning attributes that we pull from CyberArk. So email, name, first name, last name. And what we're actually doing is crafting a header out of that to feed into the legacy app. And so in doing this demo, so we've basically gone start to finish here, is we've taken a legacy app. It doesn't know anything has changed. We're still giving it the information that it was expecting via a header. And now we've actually got it all set. And it's actually accepting all the modern protections that it gets from CyberArk. Again, no changes to the app needed. And this is really critical because at scale, I mean, we see customers with hundreds, if not thousands of apps. I'm sure you do too as well, uh, Brandon, as you're looking at this. Of course, of course. And I love this integration so much, Mark, because uh, Strata really helps teams run faster, right? You don't have to spend tech tech time tackling that tech debt. <laughs> yep. Put Strata in there and really, really get it going. And and CyberArk uh, does the same in, in many ways in our deployment, but we really provide that security layer, the security engine. So all of our modern security controls that customers come to CyberArk for and need, you can now put this into your legacy applications and Strata is the avenue to just make that super, super fast. So I, I'm so excited about this integration for our customers. I love seeing it out there. I love it. I love it. And what we're going to do is um, I like to just sort of focus on some takeaways from the, the session that we had today. So we, we jokingly call this like the restaurant session. And we were taking that vintage automobile and, and dropping that electric crate motor in it and making it work flawlessly so that you don't have to throw away all the good things that you've already created. You simply need to modernize it and you need to modernize it in a fast and efficient way. And so if we were to leave the audience with four takeaways, you know, Brandon, you and I have had this conversation quite a bit. I'll take the first one, you know, refactoring uh, is really not the way that you want to modernize app identity. So as you think about apps themselves, you should be refactoring for all the right reasons, but not because you have to do it simply because you're adding a new IDP in front of it. There's this identity uh, refactoring treadmill that I think our audience can relate to that as soon as you've refactored the app for a new standard or a new service, you're going to have to do it all over again because the regulation has changed or a new business uh, directive has come down and you just keep rewriting these apps. Let's get them off the treadmill. Let's not refactor. Let's use that wiring harness that Strata provides to make it easy and fast. What do you think about number two here? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Strata has been super helpful for helping us de-risk uh, migrations, like this whole integration together as customers look to keep their their applications. Because as you said, Mark, and many times developers have made these for real business purposes. So you you need to keep this application around as a business, right? Um, but if, if you've integrated that with a legacy IAM system, you want to make sure that when you go to to modernize your stack for all the reasons we talked about today, that that legacy app, it's going to have support. It's going to be able to be accessible the same way, have the same security controls. So that Strata and CyberArk together, de-risking that, that process to get off your legacy IAM, it's it's one of the keys to this partnership. I love it. No, I'll hopefully number, oh, number yeah. three, too, if you don't mind. But sorry. Please, do it. Please, do it. Do it. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, three here, I was going to say on the modernizing, um, th- th- this is definitely, we talked about all the different reasons. If you're, if you still have a self-hosted on-premises IAM system, then here's our, our, uh, pitch, right. As to why you, you might want to get off it. I think it really does map, uh, very well to the, uh, example we said about not having seatbelts, not having airbags, not having all of these basic requirements that we have been uh, pushing as cybersecurity professionals for a long time. Now let's practice what we preach, right? Let's make sure we have those modern IM controls, which are so just basically foundational uh, to keeping our businesses protected. I love it. You know, and 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 I'll, I'll grab this last one. Just simply the idea of using identity orchestration to modernize once and stay flexible forever. Sure, that sounds like a little bit like marketing speak, but the idea here is we showed how easy it was to migrate an application from a legacy WAM provider over to CyberArk Identity. But you've once you have done that and you actually have orchestration in the mix and inside of your architecture, you can start adding additional services from CyberArk just as easily without rewriting the app. So we are adding CyberArk MFA and we're doing whatever else that we need to do to the application based on changing business environments. The app never changes. You're doing all this at this abstraction layer, at this orchestration layer. And again, it just you, you talked about speeding up efficiency for teams, helping them do things faster and, and focus on really hard problems instead of that that growing tech list of de- tech debt list of uh, problems that they inherited. And so really, we just want to suggest get off that at treadmill, stop refactoring for all the wrong reasons and, and really embrace all the best security things that are out there. And, and, and to do so, work with with the two of us, I suppose, is the, the, the closing thoughts there. Well. Brandon, thanks so much for joining me and and having this conversation again. This was a lot of fun. Absolute pleasure, Mark. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Absolutely. Well, we're going to put a couple of QR tags on the screen that'll give people our uh, LinkedIn profile information. We'd love to engage with folks. Um, We can promise you sort of an anti-sales workshop-y session. We just want to geek out with you and and talk about where identity can fit in this. And, you know, you've got legacy IAM infrastructure. You've got legacy apps that you feel like are, are stuck and you can't budge them off of whatever platform they're stuck on today. It's not true. We can get you there fast. There's a way to drop that electric crate motor in, map to all the things that you want it to map to, and really do this overnight. So hopefully you reach out to us. Thank you for spending your time with us today as well. And we hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone.